what would be your practical advice? I mean, it sounds like you both, you and your wife were both raised in broken homes. You get married at 19 and 20 and you have this love that you've shared. You've raised children together. You've built your, as you say, your dreams together. Okay. What, what practically, what, especially for men, let's just stay on men here. Like what practically do they need the tools in order to have that success story? Because it sounds like you weren't necessarily raised with that modeled in your life, but you guys figured it out. There, there was aspects of it. Like I always say, like, I'm, I'm very grateful for my father and my mother. I'm very sorry that they, they didn't stay married. But um, by the same token, I have seven brothers and sisters I wouldn't have had if, if they had stayed together necessarily. And so, look, there, there's always <laughs> – God can always turn things for, for, a noble, for a noble purpose or a good outcome. Um, and, and my dad and my mother were both still influential in my life and my morals, um, even if it wasn't reflected in their marriage. But here, here's what I would say for, for men specifically, um, men need a mission. Men need a mission. Um, there, there, somebody said this once where they were talking about how they treat female depression and male depression and the way they treat female depression tends to be, um, with, with coming alongside someone and providing support and hearing them out and, and empathizing and sympathizing with them and providing a network of people that, um, lets them know they're not alone. And when you ever try to, when you try to treat male depression the same way, it doesn't work. Um, because men need a mission. We need a noble mission. You give us a noble mission and we'll crawl, we'll crawl across broken glass to achieve it if we believe in it. And the thing that I, we try to tell young men is that, look, you do have a mission. You do have a, a purpose. You may be struggling to figure out what it is, but it's there. And, and for, for most men, maybe not all, but for most men, part of that mission, will be getting married and having children. And, you know, there, there's this statement that people don't like anymore where they, they say that, you know, men civilize the, the wild and women civilize men. And whether you like that or not or agree with it or not, there is an element of truth in that because I, I know this much. There was a lot of things that I kind of wanted to do with my life and different objectives that I had, whether it was my military objectives or professional objectives. But if you want to know the thing that truly motivates me, my wife and my children and, and my responsibility to them, th- there is... There, there is no philosophy, there's no patriotism, there's no country, as, as deeply as I feel those other things. None of that ultimately compares to what I will do and what I will endure for the safety and love of my wife and my children. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you do have a wife that has that similar worldview and brings out the absolute best in you, you you will recognize a sense of of accomplishment and purpose that you would never be able to accomplish in isolation. When when you hold your child for the first time, you know I, I always tell guys whenever they're about to have a little girl for the first time, like you think you're a tough guy, right? I've spent most of my life around tough guys, right? You think you're a tough guy, and then you have a little girl, and you find out what an utter sap you are, right? A, a total and complete sap. Right. And then you, and then you have a son and you realize that, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to prepare this young man for the world. I have to prepare him to be a husband or a father one day. All of those things provide men with purpose and meaning. And then the question is, is what sort of moral precepts, what sort of guidelines are are going to, um, take them along this path to make sure that they're good men? Because, Because here's the, here's the dirty little secret about toxic masculinity. When properly under, uh, when properly explained, there is such a thing as toxic masculinity, just like there's such a thing as toxic femininity. But, but here's the little, <laughs> here's the devil in the details that a lot of the people that use those terms don't like to admit. As soon as they say that, you know what they're admitting to? A binary. They're actually admitting that there are masculine traits and that there are feminine traits. And that when we look at things like aggression or competitiveness or a capacity for violence, these traits are morally neutral until they're actually put into action. So, so the man that uses that uh, aggression or that competitiveness or that capacity for violence to, to take a, a woman's purse and run down the street, that is a, that is a negative manifestation of a masculine trait. But then when the other man steps in and stops him, and returns it, those are positive manifestations of those masculine traits. So this is not a question of whether or not the traits will exist. It's a question of whether or not they will receive positive manifestations and positive outworkings or negative ones. Here, yeah. Here's the question about that, because I think so many men have been effectively emasculated. I mean, between pornography, 
between you mentioned the school system, you know, it's not good for young boys typically like sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day. I know there's recess, but like just kind of the structure of it for young boys, especially is not designed for their flourishing, Uh, you know, video games, um, you know, just you you can talk about even like the maybe environmental factors, uh, birth control pills in our water that is literally Mm -hmm. depleting testosterone. I mean, all of this stuff or, you know, the additional estrogen there. I mean, do you think that we the problem is that men aren't wild enough? I mean, to, the, the raw material of what men are it has not only been disrespected um, and it's not properly channeled, but it's also just it's been broken at large because of these societal factors. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, culture culture will eventually produce the sort of men it's asking for. And, and right now it's asking for weak, emasculated men. And it turns out nobody likes the results. I mean, I, 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 I pointed this out and some people got mad with me. I said, you know, isn't it fascinating that as soon as the T-80s rolled over the Ukrainian border, nobody was asking for the gender studies majors to show up and, and teach the Russians about tolerance and equity. They just wanted a dude that could shoot a Russian, right? They just wanted somebody that could actually protect, protect their country. Mm-hmm. And the, this idea that we have in the West where we've lived under so much security, so much prosperity, so much relative freedom from either want or danger that it, it rises. It, it elevates this notion that those skills or those attributes are no longer required, that they're archaic and that they're, they're more, they're more dangerous than what they're worth. Okay. In, until you realize that, that emasculated men don't make for a safe society for women, so some of the worst abusers that you will ever see, some of the most depraved serial killers you ever see were emasculated men and they took it out on women. And so at, at, at no point, at no point do I want a society of, of, of weak, complacent, docile women, but this idea that you're, you're going to get a better, safer society with, with emasculated men is just absurd. And it's been demonstrated throughout history. And, and so again, how do we the, turn the, that back? I mean, what do we do with all these, all the men who are, you know, there's this, that statistic earlier, 63% of men mm-hmm. versus only a third of women are single today. You know, they're, they're not because of any number of reasons they're not interested or they're not able to be in a relationship. And I'm not saying everyone is bound for sort of a marriage or a relationship, but I would say the yeah. large majority of people are biologically. It's the way we're wired. I think it's how we're designed. So some people aren't called to that, but many people, more people are. So what about, you know, what are the, <laughs> with all this generation of men, you know, we, you're talking about wanting them to direct their wildness towards greatness and, and the morality mm-hmm. needed for that, which is so key. But what about just recreating or sparking the wildness to begin with, you know, in a good way? So I I think it's a couple of things. Like, um, I think John Lovell does a great job of this in his book. He uh, he does, yeah. He's awesome. Um, He he does a great job on this. Matt Boudreaux. um, There's other guys in this sphere. And and, and I I think what you're starting to see is something of a... um, I don't know if competition is the, is the right place, but basically different paths where, where young men are going to go to get advice. And some of it is what they, you know, uh, refer to as kind of this secular manosphere where, uh, again, it's, it's the workout, be professional, do all these other things, uh, be intellectual, ha- have good, you know, you know, be, um, intellectually formidable. But then with respect to its concept of relationships, it's, it's broken. And then it's, it's usually rooted in, in something of a hedonistic philosophy that, that doesn't ultimately make sense. Then, then you've also got, uh, this view where it's kind of the scholarly approach where it's telling young men that there's, there's things that they have to prioritize and they have to be good and they have to be noble. But what, what men really, I think what young men really need to see is they, they need to see men that, that do a good job of combining the warrior and the scholar or the warrior and the poet as, as John Lovell would, would describe it. Um, they don't want to be, they don't want to just be lectured to. Um, if, if you're going to, if you're going to offer an alternative, then they want to see somebody that they believe is, is formidable along those masculine lines. And so I, I think the, me where I'm, I'm approaching this from the Christian perspective. It, it's about reopening this whole idea of what is it, what does it mean to be a strong Christian man? Well, a strong Christian man isn't weak. A strong Christian man um, is intellectually formidable, professionally formidable, physically formidable, um, th- and they're emotionally formidable as well. Like I, I always say that there's there's a my wife worded it best. I was I was trying to capture this where I was saying like men don't we don't like to be vulnerable, we don't like to be weak, and she goes, yeah, but babe, you, you got to be able to show us tenderness. Like there, there's a, there's a tenderness that you display and, and, and she described it for me and it helped me understand it and articulate it better. 
She goes, babe, there, there is a tenderness that you display toward me. There's a tenderness that you display toward our daughters that the rest of the world doesn't get, but every once in a while they get to see a glimpse of it. She goes, that's really important. That's really important. And, and I, and I do think that's critical. The, the other